I've heard it said that America's greatest days are behind her. I've also heard it said that conservatism is dead. Well, I'm here to tell you that neither is true. We do not accept the condition that the Republic is in today. We do not accept that the decline of America is inevitable. We are here because we believe in individual liberty, national sovereignty. We believe in unalienable rights and private property rights. We believe in national security and a strong military. And yes, we are people of faith who have real values and morals that we believe are handed down over the centuries. We've had men and women throughout our history who have fought evil, who have fought forces much stronger than the ones we're addressing today. And they succeeded. Our parents, their parents, and the parents before them. We owe it to our children and grandchildren and their progeny to do everything we can to maintain this country as the greatest country on the face of the earth. When we look into the future, we see a nation that needs more and more patriots like you. More and more people who will stand up, more and more activists who will defend this country from what's taking place. The smothering of the individual, the smothering of free enterprise, the smothering of our police officers and our military personnel. The time has come to draw a line in the sand and that is what we are doing today. God bless you, thanks for coming. This is your Conservative Review, Conservative Convention. Ladies and gentlemen, please rise for our national anthem, sung by Greenville's own Courtney Arnold. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming who's brought stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in the Still there, oh, say, does that star spangled banner yet wave or the Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome author, blogger, TV commentator, and senior editor of Conservative Review, your host for the evening, Michelle Malkin. Hello, my fellow patriots. Are you excited to be here tonight with your fellow out and proud conservatives? Yes. Can we please give another round of applause to Courtney? Don't you think she gave Lady Gaga a run for her money? Yes! On behalf of all of my colleagues at Conservative Review, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, each and every one of you, 
for showing up today and standing up for liberty, for the Constitution, and for our great nation. My friends, this is a safe space. This is a safe space to proclaim our common commitment to the values of life, liberty, property, prosperity, and for our common and shared understanding that the role of government is not to hand out goodies and candy. It's not to guarantee anything but to provide for the common defense, to promote the general welfare, and to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity unapologetically. Yeah. So speaking of safe spaces and the craziness that we see at so many college campuses, the University of California at Berkeley. And this is a time where we can all join in booing. Boo! By the way, my husband, who was my first convert, was born and raised in Berkeley, California, believe it or not, which tells you that there is always hope, and you never know who you can turn around. You never know, right? Well, at the University of California at Berkeley last summer, some social justice committee declared that the phrase, America is a land of opportunity, was tantamount to a hate crime. And here we are gathered together celebrating America as a land of opportunity with happy warrior smiles on our faces, and these people are brainwashing the next generation of Americans to believe that proclaiming our belief in the American dream and equality of opportunity is somehow a microaggression. This is everything that's wrong with this country. This is why all of us feel so compelled to stand up and be counted. And every single one of your voices is so important, especially at a time when not just the progressive left, but many people who pretend to be our allies tell us to be quiet, to tone it down. Do you think it's time to turn down the volume or turn up the volume? We make joyful noises because we believe in the opportunity that America represents. We understand the privilege it is to live and work in this country and raise our children and grandchildren. So no, as long as I breathe air in America, I'm not going to turn it down. And I can tell you from personal experience, when you have Joy Behar in one of your ears and Whoopi Goldberg in the other, the only choice you have is to crank it up. Yeah. We have some amazing, amazing speakers tonight. Not only some great, GOP presidential candidates that you'll hear from later in the evening, but also some incredible conservative leaders in our courtrooms, in the public square, on TV, in every arena where we need to be stand up and counted. And these are heroes of mine who have not only walked the walk and talked the talk, but have suffered the slings and arrows that you have to face today in standing up and being a proud American and a proud conservative. And what we're trying to do here at Conservative Review, the Conservative Convention today, is embolden you and inspire you and make sure that you understand that in a campaign season where there's a lot of noise, and where there are a lot of people who've forgotten what's important, that we remind you that we are all grounded in the first things and the first principles, and that we understand that we have a heavy responsibility in carrying on the legacy 
of our great founding fathers. And if that's a microaggression, I'm going to say it even louder. Now, many of you know me as the angry brown lady in the box on cable TV. But tonight, my primary role is to be a facilitator. I'm your hostess. You can call me your Vanna White for the evening. I am also going to be a tiger mom enforcer uh, of our time to make sure that uh, everything goes along um, swiftly and efficiently, be, uh, efficiently, because I am all about efficiency. Uh, but I am also the queen of social media, right? As just a blogger and just a tweeter. And I want to make sure that on so much of that left-wing social media space that our voices are heard. So make sure if you've got your mobile device that you are tweeting the hashtag CRConvention and let them know that you're here and that you're going to enjoy the rest of this evening. Our first speaker this evening is a brilliant economist, a principled voice for liberty, someone who resigned his job at the RNC in protest of that infamous broken no new taxes pledge. Remember that? And this is what's so special about the work that we do at Conservative Review because it's not just holding the left's feet to the fire, but also a lot of the GOP establishment in D.C. that for, has forgotten why we sent them there in the first place. So please give a warm welcome to one of those men who does that work on a daily basis, Matt Kibbe. Thank you. Hi, my name's Matt, and I'm a libertarian. We got a couple of libertarians in the audience, and naturally, naturally, libertarians, we want to talk about drugs, right? I'm not talking about marijuana, I'm talking about something really dangerous, an epidemic that is corrupting our children. It's fogging their minds, it's screwing up with their judgment. And if you look at a map of the United States, you will see a clear path of tra trafficking. It seems to start, it seems to come from Burlington, Vermont. <laughs> and this nasty product has shown up in Iowa. It's shown up in New Hampshire. And if you guys aren't careful, you're going to see it on the streets of South Carolina any day soon. The barking thing is awesome. Of course, I'm not talking about marijuana. I'm talking about Bernie Sanders peddling socialism to our children. It's a dangerous thing, it's got to stop. Of course, even Bernie won't admit that he's a real socialist. He has to qualify it. He says, I'm a democratic socialist because he understands that amongst American voters, the S word is still a dirty word. But what is, what is the difference, do you suppose, between socialism, which is complete government control of the economy, it's the elim elimination of money, it's the elimination of prices, it is the replacement of the market with one top-down system where the government produces everything and the government redistributes everything. That for form of socialism, by the way, has killed conservatively about 100 million people. It's a really bad thing which is why Bernie talks about democratic socialism. But I don't get it, because to me, democracy is all about shifting power back to the end user. It's all about giving people more choices and more control over their own lives. It doesn't fit with socialism. My mentor, my intellectual mentor, Ludwig von Mises, said that socialism and democracy do not go together. 
Do you guys agree with that? So, I watch Chris Matthews, I'm sure you all do, right? Did you happen to see the show where he interviewed Hillary Clinton and he asked her a simple question? What is the difference between a Democrat and a socialist? Did anyone see this? I've been on Matthew's show, he's pretty relentless and he was pretty tough with her. She did not have an answer. She could not tell Chris Matthews the difference between a Democrat and a socialist. Why do you suppose that is? Are you saying it's the same darn thing? So we got to do something about this because I was in Iowa and I saw a lot of kids that are frustrated with the system, they're frustrated with the establishment. Barack Obama's policies have failed them, they can't find jobs, they have student debt, they're looking for answers, and there's Bernie Sanders peddling this nasty product. We got to do something about this because I think that kids today understand freedom even more than you or I do. They live in a world where they curate everything. They choose their music. They choose their friends online. They choose their jobs on monster.com if they don't like their boss. They create virtual realities that very much look like what you and I call the free market. So I'm asking you guys, when you go home tonight, particularly if you've sent your son or daughter to a public university, Call them up, give them the talk. If your kids are in high school, you got to do the same thing. Socialism kills. Just say no. Thank you very much. Awesome. How many parents and grandparents do we have out in the audience? Yes. Matt Kibbe does great videos for Conservative Review that are, are wonderful ways of immunizing your children against the flu. You don't want them to feel the burn, you want them to feel the flame of liberty that we try to, to yes, turn on and crank up proudly at Conservative Review. So thank you, Matt. I am so excited to introduce our next speaker. He's a personal hero of mine, and he shows you by his story, which was a miracle of historic proportions in bringing down one of those corrupted, yes, my trademark word, crap weasel. Those crap weasels in D.C. who say one thing to get elected and then do the exact opposite and throw the very constituency that's, that sent them there under the bus. And someone has to stand up and say no more. And Congressman Dave Bratt was one of those people. He speaks and he thinks with uncommon clarity about the most important issues that face us today with regard to immigration and national security and the fact that American workers matter, American lives matter, American law matters. He is one of the few who have earned a 100% liberty score from Conservative Review. So please help me welcome a true patriot, Congressman Dave Brack. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Conservative Review, for hosting this great event uh, for the presidentials. It's hard to follow Matt Kibbe, but uh, I'm going to give you the three uh, pillars that I ran on, the foundation for the uh, greatest country on earth, the United States of America. And I'm going to give you six quick points, and I'm going to get out of here. <clears throat> and so for an economics professor of 20 years to keep it to five minutes, uh, that's going to be a challenge. 
All right, so the utter foundation for Western Civ and for what made this country great, number one is the Judeo-Christian tradition. <clears throat> no need to be apologetic about that. When the Speaker of the House looks out from that chair in the Congress, what's the biggest bust they see right in front of them? Moses. Moses represents the law. Anybody believe in discipline and the law anymore in this country? Yeah. Might want to point out uh, that the most important event in the Hebrew Scriptures is called the Exodus. God led the Hebrews out from a corrupt king into the promised land. And when God gives someone a land, does the land have borders? Yes. It's amazing how that works, isn't it? <clears throat> it's in the news today a little bit. So, very interesting, and so then we get up to the Judeo-Christian part, and Jesus comes along with love and compassion. Uh, did that come out of just anywhere, or did that come out of the Judeo-Christian tradition only? Yes, Rome was as corrupt as it comes, <clears throat> and into Rome comes Jesus, love and compassion, and within 300 years, you have the Holy Roman Empire, and Jesus beats cold, sterile Rome every day. Are you with me? <clears throat> After Rome comes pillar number two. Pillar number two is the rule of law, starting with the Magna Carta. Human rights language starts about the 1400s. I'm a professor, so I know that kind of stuff. Then we get up to our famous philosophers, Locke, Jefferson, Madison, from my district in Virginia. My district uh, was at it a year ago making waves. Thank you. The whole country is making huge waves this year with the presidential. It's great news. And uh, Madison, just so you know, went to Princeton Theological Seminary, where I went. And when he was done, roughly speaking, College of New Jersey, but when he was done with undergrad, when he was done with undergrad, guess what he stuck around and studied just for kicks? Hebrew. You think that's an accident? So the guy who writes the Constitution of the United States studies Hebrew for kicks. So that worldview informs the writing of our Constitution. And in the Judeo-Christian tradition, are we all angels or are we fallen a little bit? In the good book, how long does it take us to go bad? One chapter, Genesis 1. You with me? Right? So if you know human nature is fallen, how do you set up a government? Do you set it up? with the judiciary and the legislative and then the executive and the separation of powers? Would that be a smart thing to do? Uh, just in case, by some quirk in history, you run into a president that does executive overreach on a daily basis. Are you with me? And we've lost track of that uh, constitutional framework. And Mark Levin and Michelle are phenomenal on that. Michelle, I just read her book on uh, illegal immigration amnesty, fantastic book. The third pillar comes about right in there, 1776, with who? Adam Smith and free markets. All of human history, people made $500 a year for all of human history in every country on earth until about 1700. And then you get a hockey stick with a massive economic growth. What caused that? Freedom and free markets. And that's it. And we own that moral story, right? Luckily, when I started teaching economics 20, ago, 20 years ago, China was only making $1,000 a year per person. Now China is making $9,000 a year per person. Same with India. So two and a half billion people on this planet, all children of God, have had the most massive increase in human welfare known to man. Did government make that happen or did the rejection of government and free markets make that happen? Free markets. I'm probably already bumping up against five minutes, but here we go. I got 18 seconds to give you six points I ran on in Virginia. Adherence to the free market system, equality under the law for every single person because we're all made in God's image, fiscal responsibility. This year under Republican leadership, we're increasing the deficit by 105 billion. Deficits will be one trillion a year by 2026. The debt right now is 19 trillion. It'll be 30 trillion in a decade. And we have this little number called $100 trillion in unfunded liabilities. If you don't know what that is, go look it up and spread it around the country because it's the, the number one major economic problem this country has right now. 
What does it mean to you in a nutshell? It means that in 11 years, and this is all CBO, right? This isn't, they brand on some crazy economic blog page, right? This is CBO, Congressional Budget Office. In 11 years, all federal revenues will go only to the mandatory spending programs and entitlements. There will not be one dollar left for the national defense, transportation, education, or running the government in 11 years. Number four, adherence to the Constitution. You're going to hear plenty on that tonight. Uh, number five, uh, peace is best preserved through a strong national defense. Our current president won the Nobel Peace Prize prematurely, it appears. <clears throat> Do you see liberty breaking out all over the world? No. So the theory there was if you downgrade the United States and bring us down a notch, the whole world will thrive. How has that worked out? It's, it's terrible from China to Russia to Iran to ISIS to North Korea. Everywhere you look is a disaster. And finally, in closing, getting back to where I opened, and this is all the, re the Republican creed of Virginia that I'm citing these six points. And it's really just the American creed. And so finally, faith in God is recognized by our founders is absolutely essential for strong moral fiber. And everyone on this stage and everyone in this audience, <clears throat> God bless you all for showing up here tonight and doing the hard work to keep liberty and to keep free markets and to keep the rule of law and to keep the Judeo-Christian tradition moving strongly ahead. God bless you all. Thank you for having me. And God bless the United States of America. Thank you. At this very moment, Americans sit anxiously awaiting the next terrorist attack on our soil. It's no longer a question of if, but when. The recent terror attack in San Bernardino was the latest and greatest act of war to go largely ignored by this administration, lost in an incredible sense of denial. It took the president 16 days to even go pay homage to the dead. Instead of moving troops to secure our southern border, he opens up the floodgates to Syrian refugees. And throughout what is rising to the level of a new world war, he remains driven to reduce our rights to own guns. Should anyone be surprised why Americans are afraid? ISIS does hate America, but they're not motivated by our exceptionalism. Like Hitler, they're motivated by their own evil desire to conquer the world. They want a worldwide caliphate where Sharia law rules. Their leader, al-Baghdadi, believes he's been selected by God to rule this new world. And as the months go by and ISIS continues to gain territory, their supporters around the world are watching closely. And their faith in Baghdadi grows. Could he really be the next caliph? Could he really defeat the West? And what does President Obama do to respond? He takes minor military action against him, pinprick bombing with no intent to destroy, almost pretending to fight, which all of a sudden makes Baghdadi seem capable of defeating America. And this is what inspires lone wolves to join the fight. Mr. President, I urge you, secure the southern border of America with troops. Stop the inflow of refugees from places like Iraq and Syria. And swiftly, with all American might, destroy ISIS and al-Baghdadi, leave no stone unturned, and send a message to jihadis across the earth that they will never overcome the land of the free. Otherwise, we're only counting down the days to an attack on American soil, one which might make Pearl Harbor or September 11th pale in comparison. And history, Mr. President, will remember you as a weakling. Yes. Can I get an amen for that message? Amen. That's what we need more of in this country. Plain spoken, speaking truth to power. And that's exactly what our next speaker has done for his entire career as a lawyer, as an author, as a syndicated columnist. He's somebody that I've known for 17, almost 20 years now, a very good friend of mine, and somebody who is going to light your fires. Please welcome David Limbaugh. Yeah. Ho, 
hold it down out there. Thank you very much, Michelle. During the Cold War, they had given me five minutes, so I got to hurry. So if I talk fast, just I can't help it. During the Cold War, we often heard that the communists would defeat this nation without firing a shot. And statists have been undermining our system now for decades. And while we've seen the partisan pendulum swing back and forth during these years, the gradual march of socialism has continued unabated because compromising with status has never yielded a net positive for liberty. But it wasn't until seven years ago that America elected a full-blown Marxist, a racist to the core, a man bitterly resentful toward America as founded, and who campaigned on a promise to fundamentally transform it and has done everything in his power to fulfill his wicked promise. Who would have imagined that despite his sinister intentions, Obama could make so much progress in accelerating America's decline? But here we are, in dire straits. And unless we regain control from these malcontents, we'll lose America forever and our kids will be robbed of the blessings of liberty that we've enjoyed. And by the way, this is not hyperbole. They say conservatives have no positive ideas. We're just naysayers, extremists who want to turn America into a police state and rig the system for those at the top. But the real extremists have moved this country so far left that for us to advocate even a mild return is characterized as extreme. But there's nothing extreme about the Constitution and liberty. So, so what do we believe in? Do we still believe in American exceptionalism and in the constitutionally prescribed limitations on government, our separation of powers, our federalist system, of dividing powers between the state and federal governments and the Bill of Rights? Or are we fatalistically resigned to diluting our platform to a pathetic, futile, and cowardly effort to pander to so-called moderates and independents? Have we chosen to become Democrat light, to distinguish ourselves from Democrats with pale pastels rather than bold colors? I know that despite your horror about what's going on in this country, you refuse to pronounce America dead. You wouldn't be here if you were ready to surrender to a liberal establishment that has infiltrated every aspect of our culture, our educational institutions, and our government. We must prevent these dark forces from finally turning, into, um, turning America into something my parents wouldn't even recognize. We must fight to take America back until we have no more breath remaining in us. And despite, obviously I have plenty of breath, despite what Obama always says and his partisan patriots dutifully repeat, I mean the partisan parrots dutifully repeat, we do have wonderful ideas that include truly sealing the border and reinstituting the rule of law, and freeing the private sector to unleash our limitless productive potential. We have specific workable plans to reform health care, and they say we don't, to restructure entitlements, to reinstitute responsible spending on constitutionally prescribed government services, to roll back the regulatory state, and to stop using the tax code to punish private sector job producers. We also have tried and tested programs to wean people off government dependence. So we implemented those, and they rolled those back because they were working, and they were, they were disappointing Democrats who might turn into Republicans. We have programs to free them from the prison of inferior public schools in the inner cities and to unburden our energy industry. We are committed to thoroughly defeating our mortal enemy, radical Islam. Yeah, that's radical Islam, our enemy. and refurbishing our military to remain the strongest, most benevolent, and never forget that, world power in history. We will fight for the lives of the innocent unborn, 
and for traditional values that God ordained as necessary for the organization of a civil society. We will appoint originalist judges to safeguard the Constitution and our precious liberties. Above all, we must not be ashamed of our ideas and we must start articulating them unapologetically. We know they have always worked, so why should we ever want to emulate Democrats? In the meantime, let us rebut the infernal leftist slander that depicts us as uncompassionate, racist, and sexist. Our policies produce the most prosperity for the most people, and despite what Democrats say, we are not opposed to reasonable safety nets for those who slip through the cracks. It is Democrat policies that destroy, that impoverish, and that enslave the very people they claim to care most about. Obama lectures us, Obama lectures us on in income inequality while his policies have grossly exacerbated it, and as if he's an innocent bystander. We aspire to a colorblind and genderblind society which treats all people equally under the law. We do not believe in using the law to pick winners and losers, but to ensure equal opportunity and maximum liberty for all. So, so let's unite. Let's unite in our positive vision for America and quit shooting ourselves over disagreements within the party. Establishment Republicans have surely now learned the folly of attempting to purge the conservative base from the party. We must, we must defeat our common opponent, which is well underway to bankrupting and deeply weakening America. So let's join together to take America back and to restore it as the glorious land of liberty our ancestors established and spilled blood to protect as the shining city on the hill that remains the envy of the rest of the globe, even as it is under siege by the radical left. With our undying dedication, steadfast prayers, and God's blessings, we can do this. So let's man our foxholes fox holes, and prepare for battle. God bless you, my fellow patriots, and Godspeed as we march forward. Good evening, Upstate. Good evening, Upstate South Carolina. I'm Mike Gallagher from 94.5 WGTK-FM, and I'm so honored to be able to welcome you tonight. It's so amazing to look out over this crowd and see what America looks like. You guys are amazing, and this is a, an incredible event. Our next speaker is somebody I've known for nearly 20 years. Sean Hannity and I started in New York City Radio at about the same time together. And it's uh, a privilege to be able to report to you that no matter how big he's become or how popular he's become, he has stayed the grounded, God-loving, family-loving, American-loving patriot that he is. And I'm very proud to announce that on the station that I'm heard on here in the upstate, 94.5 WGTK-FM, beginning April 4th, Sean will start live on our station at 3 o'clock every afternoon. So I hope you can tune in to 94.5. WGTK-FM. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a warm upstate welcome to the one and only Sean Hannity. Mike Gallagher. How are we all doing, South Carolina? All right. I am a presidential candidate. I need you to guess who I am. <laughs> you cannot make this stuff up. Oh my, this is, is this a great year? Are you excited that in November we have an opportunity to change America and take it back and transform it to back to what it was, right? You know, I watch Obama. He's the president. Not much longer. 
This is a great crowd. I'm loving this. All right, so I watch it. You know, he's still seven years in blaming Bush. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Nick, for example, and only liberals can do this. Knick knack, patty whack, you give your dog a bone. You're a dumb liberal. You give the dog a bone, you take the bone back, and the dog bites you. It's not your fault you're a dumb liberal. It's not the dog's fault that he wants his bone that you gave him. Who does the president still blame? Bush, right? Now, if the dog bites your bee stings, say, you know what it's like, you have wasp nests down here in South Carolina, right? All right, you're a dumb liberal. You take a baseball bat. You, instead of hiring the exterminator like every smart person, conservative, you'd hire a, an exterminator. And you take the baseball bat and you knock the wasp nest down and the bee stings you. It's not your fault. It's not the wasp's fault. Whose fault is it? I see some of you have a very big smile on your face right now. And that's because you've been drinking heavily tonight. How many's had Jack Daniels tonight? Budweiser tonight. Vodka martinis tonight. When you wake up tomorrow and you have a massive headache, I want to tell you, according to Obama, it's not your fault. It's not Jack Daniels' fault. It's not Budweiser's fault. Whose fault is it? You were expecting something totally different here tonight, weren't you? Now, by the way, I've got to give, I'm looking out at this crowd Guys, big hands, beautiful women of South Carolina, we love them, right? Without them, we are lost. Women, I can actually, I have this ability. I'm looking out in the crowd and I can see many of you are pregnant. It's not your fault. It's not his fault either. Whose fault is it? No! Hannity, it's me, Bill Clinton. I, you know, I know Hillary's running. I can't blame Bush for that sucker, uh, you know. Uh, Y'all having a good time tonight? So the great one, Y'all love my buddy Mark Levin? I am so proud of Mark Levin. You know, there's a real story. I had to make him go into radio. I made him fill in for me on my radio show. I don't know what to do with those, those stupid break things that you do. What do you do with that? I'll say it. Nobody else will say it. I'll say it. And that's what I'm talking about. You big dope. You little creep. Get off my phone, you creep. Yeah. If we have any Rush Limbaugh fans here, you just heard his brother David. Sean Hannity wouldn't be up here tonight if it wasn't for me. Uh, what a national treasure, right? Wow. You know, I don't want to get, I, you, you have some wonderful people here. I know you got presidential candidates here. And I'm so glad, this whole arena is full. I'm looking at this, this is such a beautiful sight that you all care so much and love your country so much. You're looking to see if I'm lying, right? You see? <laughs> You know, and I know that there are people in this room that some of you, I know a lot of people in this room support Ted Cruz. All right. <laughs> Good night, South Carolina. No, I'm kidding. Ted's backstage with his father. He's coming out later to see you. And I know the other candidates, listen, at the end of the day, I made a decision on my radio and TV shows that I am gonna give you as much access to all the candidates throughout this entire process because I have faith and hope and belief and confidence in the American people that you're gonna make a decision. And, right, I really do. And I, and, I, and I just put them on the air and I give them the microphone and I ask them questions about the economy and about ISIS and about immigration and about all the, the issues that, that matter. Here's what I worry about, and here's why this election matters, and here's why I'm glad to be here tonight, and I'm not gonna speak a long time. I just wanna give you a few points. 
I am re I'm, I'm a father. I have a 17 year old uh, son. By the way, 17 is a brutal age. <laughs> son, how was school? Uh. Did you learn anything? No. How was your day? Uh. My daughter is just the opposite. She's 14. Daddy, I love you. I'm like, son, see, I'm not Satan. I'm a good guy. Anyway, but here's what I think about. I see young people. How old are you, darling? You're 18. I care about your future. I see this young, how old are you, honey? 14. And by the way, I'm not Bill Clinton. I'm not a creep, okay? Uh, I could see Bill Clinton up here. Hey, pumpkin, I'll give you a tour backstage in a minute. You know. I know you guys were expecting something totally different. But think about this, you know, and this is why I'm glad to see this, this arena 90% full. Because 94.5 million Americans, I say it every day on my, TV, on my radio and TV show, 94.5 million of our fellow citizens are now out of the labor force. And those liars in Washington with their phony Washington calculators tell you the unemployment rate is down to 4.9%. Well, only in Washington can you get away with not counting the chronically long-term unemployed. Those are 94.5 million of our friends, our neighbors, our fellow citizens that need jobs, that want to work and want to get ahead and want their piece of the American dream. We've got 46 million Americans that have been on food stamps for 40 months or longer. We've got 50 million Americans in poverty. Look at black teenage unemployment is now at 50%. You know, I was eight years old, I delivered papers. I was 12 years old, I was a dishwasher. I was 13, I was a cook. I was 14, I was a busboy. I was 15, I was a waiter. I was 17, I was a bartender drinking way too much. I framed houses, I did roofing, I laid tile, I painted houses. I did all this for two decades of my life. No, I, no. Now, if I didn't have all those jobs, I wouldn't be here tonight. I wouldn't be the person I am today. And all of you, I bet, in this room have a similar story to tell. My story's not unique. We all work hard because we're Americans. We don't want the government to give us stuff. We want the freedom to choose and have the opportunity and the ladder to success. Barack Hussein Obama, when, remember he said nine trillion dollars in debt, that's irresponsible, that's unpatriotic. He's gonna leave office with these young ladies in the front row and these young men back there staring at you. They're gonna leave office he, accumulating more debt than every other president before him combined. I don't hear the media asking questions about that. So we've got an economy in shambles, we got people out of work, We've got record debt and deficits. We've got 120 trillion in unfunded liabilities. And I, even, I haven't even mentioned what's happened in the world. We have open borders. It's time to secure America's borders. From a national security standpoint, I don't want, I, I've been down to the borders 12 times. 12 times for Fox News. I've been on a helicopter. I nearly fell off a horse. I was on horseback an all-terrain vehicle, I've been on boats, I've been out walking, I've seen gang members arrested, I've seen tunnels dug literally un from Mexico up into an office building under the floor, and I saw a drug warehouse nearly as big as the floor of this room going up to a ceiling about that high, full of confiscated drugs, brought in to your children. So we need to secure it to prevent ISIS from coming in. And then think of it from an economic point of view. 94 and a half million Americans out of work, and then we have unskilled labor crossing the border. Well, what does that mean? Americans out of work now have to compete with people that don't respect our laws and sovereignty, right? And it drives wages down. Do you have a question? Oh, okay. Yes, class. Did I mention that this president gave $150 billion to the number one state sponsor of terror? That he gave them the right to spin centrifuges? The right to build missile defense with Vladimir Putin in Russia? The right for 24 days inspections? You know, 
We have real serious problems in the world. We have a president that so politicized Iraq after our brave soldiers won Ramadi, won Mosul, won Fallujah, won Tikrit. Our brave soldiers shed their blood, they risked their lives, and, and we end up giving it to ISIS. Now, this is how we save America. This, to me, is about early 2014, I put together what I believe will solve our problems. On the economy, it's real simple. You don't spend more money than you take in, right? We owe it to our children and grandchildren to balance the budget. You know, Trump says we want to make America great again. Well, let's live within our means and stop robbing from future generations, right? One way you can do it is you cut one penny. If, you, if any of your families were short on money, what was the first thing you'd do? You'd cut spending. But every year, Washington builds in 8% baseline budgeting. All we got to do is you cut one penny out of every dollar Washington spends every year for eight years, and you balance your budget. We have trillions of dollars of money that corporations won't bring back because of outrageous confiscatory taxation. Almost all the Republican candidates have a plan that that repatriated money will be brought to the United States. So I'm not talking about millions or billions. I'm talking about trillions. And then they can invest then in manufacturing centers and factories and building new companies. That's going to create jobs. That's going to get people off the unemployment rolls. That's going to get the labor force participation rate you know, lower instead of higher. And then, of course, that adds to the tax base, fewer people dependent on government. Simple principles. You control your borders for national security reasons. You balance your budget. You give choice in education. These are these simple things, right? Right? I want to have, we have a problem with radical, I know Obama won't say it. They're not man-caused disasters. They're not overseas contingency operations. It's radical Islamic terrorism. They are at war with us. And I say we need to be at war with them. And we need a president. Let me combine the top two candidates are Ted Cruz and Donald Trump. Oh, relax. Can we give that guy that bottle of Jack Daniels you guys are passing around? Here's, no. Ted Cruz says we're going to carpet bomb ISIS. And Donald Trump says we're going to bomb the shit out of ISIS. So I'd like to combine the two and say we're going to carpet bomb the shit out of ISIS. Does that work? If we do these basic things, Conservative principles work. Obama has destroyed the economy. He's destroyed hope. He's destroyed opportunity for every American. It's time to take America back, transform America into an opportunity freedom society where liberty reigns and statism, liberalism, socialism, redistribution goes away. And this is what this election is all about. So my challenge to you tonight is this. I don't really care in the primary who you vote for because I know you're going to make you're going to you're going to search your heart and you're going to pray about it we're by the way it, we're still in America you can still pray it's not a public school right and we're going to have a candidate and I don't want to wake up the morning after election day and say the words president elect Hillary <laughs> woof, woof. Hillary Rodham Clinton I want Democrats to wake up the morning after election day crying knowing that their years of socialism and American weakness are over My challenge to all of you with every single breath you have from now until November and Election Day, I ask you put your heart, your spirit, your soul, every bit of strength you have, and you're doing it for your children and your grandchildren so that America will once again be that great, shining city on a hill that Reagan spoke about. 
I love you, South Carolina. God bless you all. set the record straight. There's no argument over the choice between peace and war, but there's only one guaranteed way you can have peace, and you can have it in the next second. Surrender. Admittedly, there's a risk in any course we follow other than this, but every lesson of history tells us that the greater risk lies in appeasement, and this is the specter our well-meaning liberal friends refuse to face, that their policy of accommodation is appeasement. And it gives no choice between peace and war, only between fight or surrender. If we continue to accommodate, continue to back and retreat, eventually we have to face the final demand, the ultimatum. And what then? When Nikita Khrushchev has told his people, he knows what our answer will be. He has told them that we're retreating under the pressure of the Cold War, and someday, when the time comes to deliver the final ultimatum, our surrender will be voluntary, because by that time, we will have been weakened from within spiritually, morally, and economically. He believes this because from our side he's heard voices pleading for peace at any price, or better read than dead, or as one commentator put it, he'd rather live on his knees than die on his feet. And therein lies the road to war, because those voices don't speak for the rest of us. You and I know and do not believe that life is so dear and peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery. If nothing in life is worth dying for, when did this begin? Just in the face of this enemy? Or should Moses have told the children of Israel to live in slavery under the pharaohs? Should Christ have refused the cross? Should the patriots at Concord Bridge have thrown down their guns and refused to fire the shot heard round the world? The martyrs of history were not fools. And our honored dead, who gave their lives to stop the advance of the Nazis, didn't die in vain. Where then is the road to peace? Well, it's a simple answer after all. You and I have the courage to say to our enemies, there is a price we will not pay. There is a point beyond which they must not advance. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. We'll preserve for our children this, the last best hope of man on earth, or we'll sentence them to take the last step into a thousand years of darkness. Are you enjoying yourselves? Well, you are a good-looking crowd, and you are a right-thinking crowd. Have you enjoyed all the speakers so far? Yes! So many of you know that I, I call Sean Hannity my big brother, and he is, ha, has just been such a, a wonderful friend to conservatives for so long. It is an incredible time that we live in as conservatives. And I wouldn't have chosen another time to be where I am, to espouse the views that helped my family achieve the American dream. And this is what we need. We need people who can not only articulate it, but who feel it in their bones and are not ashamed to say it. We had a devastating loss this past week with the passing of the great defender of originalism and liberty, Antonin Scalia. And the timing couldn't be more heart-wrenching, but also more trenchant and timely in reminding us of how important those next Supreme Court picks will be to the conservative movement and the future of this country. I want you, if you have your phone and Twitter and Facebook, 
to use the hashtag CRConvention and to make sure that you deliver the message that Margaret Thatcher delivered to America many, many years ago. And I want you to send this message to the GOP leaders in the Senate. Don't go wobbly on this Supreme Court battle. Don't go squishy. We've had enough squish. We've had enough marshmallows. We need people with steeled spines to fight that battle. Now, our next speaker is a lion of liberty, and he's carried that message as a young, brilliant litigator in the courtroom, and he has done what conservatives want our public officials in Washington, D.C. to do, and that is to stand up and refuse to capitulate when it comes to core constitutional principles. How would you love this title? Supreme Court Justice Mike Lee. Please welcome Jim to the stage. Thank you. First of all, I've got another idea for you. How do you like the sound of this? Senator Sean Hannity. I like it. I mean, uh, look, a five-year contract, six-year term, I know which one I would choose for Sean. Let's bring him to Washington. I want to open tonight by telling you a story, a story that I first heard told by a man named Emo Phillips, a story about a time when Emo was crossing the Golden Gate Bridge alone one night. It was late at night. No one else was on the bridge. He got halfway across the bridge, enjoying himself, and discovered that he was, in fact, not alone. There was somebody else on the bridge, only the other person who was standing on the edge of the bridge, outside the guardrail, hanging on with one hand. Emo could tell this guy was in trouble. He knew that the man was thinking about jumping, and he thought, I, I've got to stop and help him. He asked the only question that came to mind immediately. He stopped and asked the man, do you believe in God? And the man said, yes. And Emo said, me too. And Emo said, are you a Christian? And the man said, yes. And Emo said, me too. Emo asked, well, what denomination? I'm a Baptist. Me too. Are you a Northern Baptist or a fundamentalist, a, a Northern Baptist or a Southern Baptist? And the man said, I'm a Northern Baptist. Emo said, me too. This was really going well. Are you a Northern Fundamentalist Baptist or a Northern Reformed Baptist? Well, I'm a Northern Fundamentalist Baptist. Me too. Are you a Northern Fundamentalist Baptist Conference of 1857 or Northern Fundamentalist Baptist Conference of 1812? And the man said, I'm a Northern Fundamentalist Baptist Conference of 1857. And Emo said, die, you heretic, and pushed him off the bridge. <laughs> My fellow conservatives, in 2016, we have to be focused more on embracing converts than casting off heretics. Join me in that cause tonight. So yes, it's time to sharpen more pencils than knives. And remember that anger is not an agenda. Frustration is not a platform. And cynicism certainly is not conservative. The way I see it, the real question heading into this Saturday, and the real question heading into November 2016, is not whether any particular candidate running for president will be up to his job. Rather, the real question will be whether the conservatives, those of us who will choose the next president of the United States, that's up to you and me, whether we will be up to our job. You see, we've been conditioned. We've been conditioned by political candidates who don't keep their promises. And we've been conditioned by campaign consultants and by Washington elites who peddle negativity and trade in discouragement to settle, to settle for far, far less than we deserve. 
Should we do that? No. No, don't settle. Expect more. It's time for us as conservatives to think long and hard about the kind of president we're ready for. So don't get fooled. Don't settle for hype and for spin. No, demand clarity from our candidates. Don't settle for sweeping generalities and bumper sticker slogans. Demand specific proposals, because a true conservative will be prepared to give you those. Don't settle for a candidate who thinks he's a king. <laughs> Expect a president who knows, as we all know, that power belongs to the people. Don't settle for a sideshow. Expect substance. Don't settle for promises of big deals, big deals concocted with very few people at the table. <laughs> Certainly don't settle for the kind of 2,242-page spending bill negotiated in secret. In my experience, nothing good ever comes from deals like those. Expect a president who will bring the American people back into the process, which belongs to them, after all. Don't settle for a president who will be overbearing at home and apologetic abroad. Expect a president who will protect both your security and your liberty, understanding that those two are not in conflict with each other. We can defend both at once. Don't settle for less than you deserve. So who really matters? Who can make a difference? Who can turn this country around? Who can we trust? I see some familiar names out there. Now, while it might be easy to focus our attention, on who is in the race, on who's on the stage, who's backstage, who's on the screen, who's on the campaign bus. And you know, that focus has nearly swallowed up the who that really matters the most. And who really matters the most? Well, it's bold mothers who stand up for their families, for the moral protection of their homes. It's courageous fathers who teach. It's students who are always searching for the true answers. It's neighbors who lift neighbors. It's believers who know that their rights come not from any government, but from Almighty God, even the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's going to be a lot of discussion about who matters and about what matters, but we cannot lose sight of who and what matters the very most. Who can make a difference now? Well, let me tell you, it's, it's workers in businesses who will become owners of businesses. It's waiters who become restaurateurs, musicians who become composers, programmers who become high-tech entrepreneurs. And perhaps there are among us listeners who will, quite literally, become leaders for tomorrow. My fellow conservatives, if we don't find ourselves in this campaign for president, we will not have a president who stands for us at all. For the next president isn't in the boardroom, well, we are. He isn't in the classroom, we are. He's not in a factory or in a cubicle, we are. He's not in the field, he's not behind the wheel, we are. He's not in the grocery store or sitting at the kitchen table with our families, we are. You see, it's not his voice that speak for us. We, of course, speak for ourselves. That is the voice every person in our nation needs to hear. It is our voice that needs to be heard with a microphone, with a megaphone, and with a smartphone. <laughs> Ours is the voice the voice of the American conservative that echoes down through the ages, calling for the conservative principles 
that have fostered the development of the greatest civilization the world has ever known. You see, because free markets work. And in fact, free markets have done more to lift more people out of poverty than anything else ever has in hi human history or ever will, certainly more than any government ever could. Limited government isn't just a good idea. It's a constitutional right and a right to which all members of Congress and all presidents have sworn an oath to uphold, protect, and defend. And balance of power is a necessary protection. And so it's your voice that's speaking out for these things, saying, don't settle. When we expect more, we will do more, and we will become more, not just as individuals, but as an entire nation. Conservatives who expect more will carry this country into what will become an extraordinary future. You see, we have to remember, we've been here before as a nation. We've done this. Those early patriots didn't settle for tyranny, taxes, and intrusion. Reagan conservatives didn't settle for the status quo. They didn't settle for what people told them was possible at the time. They expected more. They expected freedom. And then they acted, doing their part so that we could have a chance to do our part today, right now in 2016. We expect more. We expect more great things out of conservatives all over America, starting with South Carolinians this week and then with Nevadans next week. And it's time to expect more out of ourselves. It's time to do more. It's time to become more of what conservative principles and that enable us to become. You see, because that's why we're conservative. That's why we believe in the Constitution. We believe in freedom, not just because it sounds great, but because of the great things that free people do. They help each other. They help the poor get out of poverty. They help expand the middle class. It's time to expect and to demand the country we deserve. And for that matter, it's time for us to expect the Supreme Court we deserve. The stakes here are too high, higher than they've ever been. We cannot and we will not settle for another liberal on the Supreme Court of the United States. So what does that mean for us here today? What can we do about it? Well, a lot. We must expect a proven conservative. Not somebody who just claims to be today because it's convenient, but a proven conservative who has been at the front of the battle and has the battle stars to prove it. That's the kind of conservative that we need to elect as the next president of the United States and to appoint the next Supreme Court Justice. My fellow conservatives, we cannot settle anymore. It's time for us to unite, expand, and expect more. It's time for us to raise our voices. It is time to expect victory. Thank you, Senator Mike Lee. It's time to expect victory. Hell yes! Our next speaker is one of my favorite, favorite people on Capitol Hill. Now, we've seen some really amazing and sometimes bizarre things on the campaign trail. I saw a candidate who I will not name barking on a stage. I've seen candidates sing, which I promise you I am not going to do for you today, because I know my limitations. But as some of you may know, I 
do play the piano every once in a while. And I loved the man who's going to speak to you so much that I serenaded him on his birthday. I wish I had keyboards here because I'd do a reprise for a true patriot on so many of the issues that matter to you and me, somebody from the state of Texas who you will love. It's Louis Gohmert. Come on, Congressman Gohmert. I gotta give you a hug. It's great to see you. Slay! Thank you. Wow, thank you. What a treat. Wow, what a treat for me. Ah, oh, man, just being with you guys means I'm gonna be ready for next week back in Washington. Wow, yo, you guys are so uplifting. And how about Michelle Mockin? Don't you just love her? And uh, if you knew how good she was on the keyboard, you would be astounded. She is so talented. She's amazing and can sing. But uh, also, I've got my own contested race. Uh, those of us that wanted a new speaker were told, you know, you guys are going to have primaries. We, and we do. And I, my uh, election is on March 1st for my primary. But when, uh, when Mark Levin says, would you come speak? Are you kidding? You betcha. I'll be there. So I am thrilled to be here with such good friends. And I want to say a word about Justice Antonin Scalia. I love the guy. I know you did too, if you knew him at all. And uh, there's a handful of things since I've been in Washington that are so special to me. And one was when I would get to have uh, lunch or breakfast with Antonin Scalia. He loved jokes and stories like I did. So as a tribute to that man's sense of humor, uh, We'd go back and forth. I, I'm going to tell one of them. He said, well, you know, I got that. There was one probably was down in Texas back when they were hanging people uh, for capital punishment. He said, you know, this guy had done it all, murdered, pillaged, he robbed. He was horrible. And the Saturday morning they had the big hanging. The sheriff brought him up to the gallows. 3,000 people or so gathered. And uh, the sheriff said, now we have a tradition in our town. We'll let the defendant say a few words to the crowd before we hang you. Would you like to do that? He said, no. He said, the sheriff said, I don't think you understand. You're about to meet your judge, your maker. Wouldn't you like to apologize? You got some victims' families out here. Wouldn't you like to say something? He said, no, not really. Somebody in the crowd yelled, will the gentleman yield? And the guy looked at the sheriff and said, I don't know what that means. And the sheriff said, well, that was our congressman here, and that's Congress talk for he wants you to give him his time, uh, your time to speak to the crowd. He said, could I do that? The sheriff said, well, I guess, do you want to? He says, I sure do on one condition. He said, what's that? He said, you go ahead and hang me first. Uh, <laughs> that was Justice Scalia. I love that man. Well, we are known by our friends, we're known by our enemies, and, uh, if you love John Boehner as Speaker of the House, no, I mean, we all have people that like us and dislike us. We're known by our friends and our enemies. But if you, if you like John Boehner, think, thought he did a good job, look at the people who nominated, endorsed, supported, voted for, and then look who they endorse in the presidential election. Then on the other hand, um, if you love those who demanded a new speaker so we would start keeping our word. Somebody that would stand up against the odds, against the establishment, against the media, call it like it was. If, if you like people that did that kind of thing, like uh, my friends, say, Tim Hulescamp from Kansas, or Steve King, who had to rush home tonight. Our prayers are with Steve in Maryland. He got word Maryland was in the hospital, been taken, so rushed back. And our thoughts and prayers are with Maryland tonight and Steve. But uh, also, a guy that I've learned to love, and if you don't, you got to know Jeff Duncan. Don't you love him? Yeah. Um, people like Dave Bratt and uh, Mark Meadows, Randy Weber, Jim Bridenstine, 
Hey, all of those have something in common. We stood up and demanded a new speaker, and we've all endorsed the same guy for president. So I'm just, um, and I want to tell you, let me tell you, when the Gang of Eight bill was being pushed, I'm telling you, we were devastated. We were so thrilled we had a new senator from Florida. We were so thrilled this was meant we were going to stop amnesty. McCain's bill wouldn't go anywhere no matter what McCain and Schumer did. And lo and behold, it got a really wonderful guy as the face of the bill, and it made it almost unstoppable. We were meeting at least once a week, usually over at Ted Cruz's office. There is not one thing that Ted Cruz did regarding the Gang of Eight bill or amnesty that was ever inconsistent with our plans and our strategy to stop that bill. That's the way it is. Now, some claim that this nation, to get back on track, to have a new day, to have a new awakening here, we don't need a leader who will humble himself and seek God's face we, we, and ask forgiveness and lead us in seeking God. We don't need that. Uh, what we need is not someone who will speak softly and carry a big stick. Some say what we need is somebody who will speak loud, nasty, and threatening, and then God will bless America. Well, I'm still struggling with that one a little bit. Some of us believe what 2 Chronicles 714 says. <laughs> if my people who are called by my name and it doesn't mean everybody in America, everybody's got freedom, but if the people that are called by God's name will humble themselves, right? If we will pray and seek God's face and turn from their wicked ways, then He will hear their prayers and He will heal our land. And I wanna take you back very quickly and wrap it up. We know what Ben Franklin said in 1787. He was overweight, he was 80 years old, had trouble getting up and down, had gout, arthritis. And we know what he said because he was asked for a copy of the speech immediately after he wrote it out in his own handwriting. And if you attend schools and if you get any history under Common Core, they'll tell you Ben Franklin was a deist. His own words say not so. In part, he said, I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth. God governs in the affairs of man. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it possible an empire could rise without his aid? We've been assured, sir, in the sacred writing that unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. He said, I firmly believe that. I also firmly believe without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in our political building no better than the builders of Babel. We'll be divided by our little local partial interests and we'll be confounded. We will become a byword down through the ages. Look, this country needs a new day. We need to get back on trap. We need to stop luring people away from their God-given potential by luring with little benefits into a rut they can't get out of until they're dependent on the government. We need a new day. And I know you will stand with Lincoln in his words, in essence, when he said here, it is rather for us to be hereby resolved that the great task remaining before us, that we highly resolve here and now, folks, that our patriotic forefathers and mothers who fought, who worked, who sweat, who bled, who died 
to assure us the greatest nation in history will not have done so in vain. We must highly resolve that this nation, under God, will have a new birth of freedom, that this government of the people, by the people, and for the people will not perish from the earth. God will bless us if we follow the rules. Thank you so very much. God bless you. God bless you, Louis Gohmert, a man of God. Do you know that he's a Sunday school teacher and a deacon? And boy, would I love him to come and preach in my town. Mm. This is what I'm talking about when I talk about leaders who stand up and be counted. We've got a video that we want you to watch now. Please enjoy it. People are so concerned about the future, the future for their children, the future for our nation. This country was designed around we the people, of, for, and by the people. We need a government that actually understands that and doesn't think that it is the ruler of the people. Learning from crowds that they are hungry for some honesty and for some real solutions to the problems that ail us. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Ben Carson to the stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I am so happy. So happy to be here tonight amongst fellow conservatives. And, uh, you know, interestingly, a lot of times people ask me, is it really worth all you have to go through to run for president, to have people savage your name, your reputation, attack your family, do all of those things? And the answer is no. <laughs> Not if you're doing it for yourself, but the answer is a resounding yes if you're doing it for we the people. And that's really the reason for it. Now, I, I really had no intention of entering the political arena, quite frankly. And uh, my wife and I were looking forward to a very peaceful retirement. Uh, and anything but that has happened. But um, interestingly enough, when uh, people started saying that I should run for president, I just thought it was pretty ridiculous. And I just said, um, if you ignore it, it'll go away. But it didn't go away. Every place I went, and I was doing a lot of speaking, there were people out with run, Ben, run signs. And, and then uh, after that, um, then I started getting all these petitions, 5,000 petitions a week. I had hundreds of thousands of petitions. I could barely even get into my office. And I finally said, Lord, you know this was not on my bucket list. And all the pundits say it's absolutely impossible, can't do it. You got to be a member of the political class. You can't raise money. You can't do any of those things, all of which comforted me, by the way. And then. I said, Lord, if you really want me to do this, then you have to open the doors. If you open the doors, I will walk through them. And he opened the doors, so I'm walking through them. Basically, that's what it is. Uh, you know, the thing that really has uh, disturbed me the most is recognizing what's happening to our nation. This is a nation that's supposed to be of, for, and by the people, not of, for, and by the government. And that's the reason that I was so vehemently opposed to the so-called Affordable Care Act, not because it's not affordable, 
and not because it doesn't care for people. But the reason was because it fundamentally changed the relationship between the people and the government. Instead of it being about the people, the government came along and says, we don't care what you people think. We're shoving this down your throat, and if you don't like it, too bad. That is a problem. And, you know, if we, if we accept that, then it is just the beginning of the fundamental change in relationship with the government now at the pinnacle dictating to us, which is why we, the people, must stand up for who we are and what we believe in in this country. One of the biggest problems I think that we have, to, have encountered is that the secular progressives have beaten down the people who have common sense which are the vast majority of Americans. They still have traditional values, and they still think with their brains. That means, you know, like if they don't have money, they don't spend it, things like that. But that, that has gone out of the window a long time ago, and the people with common sense have been beaten into submission by the secular progressives who really don't care whether you agree with them or not, as long as you sit down and shut up. And I'd say it's time to stand up and shout out. You don't have to do that. You know? You know, America, America is an amazing place. And there are a lot of people who like to denigrate our nation and uh, say that we're the source of all the evil in the world and that we're not exceptional. You know, if we were so bad, why are so many people trying to get in here and nobody trying to escape? You know, obviously, obviously it's a pretty nice place. And the real question is, can we keep it? Because I believe that there is an American way. There is an American dream. Have you noticed that there's no other dream? What other country has a dream? Other countries have nightmares, but nobody else has a dream, you know? And, uh, you know, and it is something that we need to be very careful to preserve. We are in the process of giving away our nation, of giving away all of our values and principles so that we can be politically correct. And I think that that is a major problem. It's the reason that I hate political correctness with a vengeance, because there were so many people who gave up everything, including their lives, so that we could have freedom of speech, freedom of expression, freedom of religion, all of our other freedoms. We cannot give those away. And this was a, such a land of dreams for me as a youngster, I dreamed of becoming a doctor. It was the only thing I ever wanted to do. Skip right over policemen and firemen. Went straight to doctor. I even like going to the doctor's office, so it tells you I was strange. I mean, I would gladly sacrifice a shot just so I could smell the alcohol swabs. And, you know, if I could wear the stethoscope and listen to somebody's heart, I mean, that was like the, the major event of the year. But um, you wouldn't have thought that I would have been successful in my quest. There were so many obstacles along the way. And uh, after my parents got divorced, you know, we lived in dire poverty. We had to move in with relatives. And uh, it's interesting because a lot of people on the left like to criticize me. They say, Carson grew up in poverty. He probably benefited from some government programs, and now he wants to withdraw all the programs. And that's hypocritical. Well, first of all, that is nothing but a blatant lie. And that's what they have a tendency to do, because they want to drive wedges between people. I have no desire to remove all the safety nets for people who need them. What I do have a desire to do is to provide a ladder of opportunity so that people can climb out of dependency and become part of America. And you know, 
that's what real conservatism is. You know, the uh, progressives try to paint conservatives as heartless, uncaring people. But I'll tell you who's heartless, uncaring. They're the people who pat everybody on their head and say, there, there, you poor little thing. I'm going to take care of all your needs and give you food stamps and housing subsidies and health care. And it makes them dependent on other people. That is not compassion. What that is, what that is, is taking advantage of people and making them subject to you. And this is what we've got to change in this country. You know, right now in more than 30 states, you can make more from accepting government benefits than you can from working a minimum wage job. And some people say, well, of course I'm going to accept the benefits. Why would I want to work if I can make just as much or more by not working? Well, you see, this is what has changed in our country. Because years ago, it would have been a no-brainer. People would have taken the minimum wage job recognizing that they would gain skills, relationships, they would be able to climb the ladder, and they would be much better off. That's called the can-do attitude. That's what made America into a great nation. And now, now we're in the process of trading that for the what can you do for me attitude. And are there people in our society who are indigent, who are downtrodden, who are disadvantaged? Without question, there are. But the people who should take care of those people are us. We the people, not the government. It is not the government's job. And no, his, historically, we have done a very good job of taking care of those in need in our society. Starting in about the 20s, Woodrow Wilson, you know, started getting involved in everything, his socialist bent. And it kept progressing. By the time we got to the 60s with LBJ, the government was saying, we are going to eliminate poverty, the war on poverty, the great society. How'd that work? You know, $19 trillion later, we have 10 times more people on food stamps, more welfare, poverty, broken homes, out of wedlock births, crime, incarceration. Everything is not only worse, it is much worse. And that's because it is not the government's job. They don't do that very well. And they need to read the Constitution. That would help us a great deal if they would do that. Now, now it could be, it could be that they did read the Constitution and they got confused when they read the preamble and it said one of the duties of the government is to promote the general welfare. And they thought that meant to put everybody on general welfare. <laughs> but obviously, it's not what it meant. And you know, the, the government, unfortunately, and I'm not an anti-government person. I'm an anti-big government, inefficient government, dominating government person. <laughs> That's not what it was supposed to be. and irresponsible government. You know, and I, I got to tell you, if, if I were in charge right now of America and I wanted to destroy it, I'll tell you what I would do. I would drive wedges between all of the people. I would have them all hating each other. A war on women, race wars, income wars, age wars, religious wars, anything I could do to get them fighting each other and thinking they were enemies. And then I would destabilize the financial foundation of the country. I would just raise the debt to unimaginable heights. I would be inviting people in here from other countries, putting them on all kind of benefits. I would be putting all the people here on benefits. I'd have everybody on food stamps, everybody on SSI disability. I would be giving people free telephones. I would be telling people, 
that you can have free college for everybody. I would just get everybody so dependent upon the government, and then I would destroy the military. I would have the smallest Navy since 1917, the smallest Air Force since 1940. I would gut the personnel through the sequester. I would have everybody depressed, have people retiring early. I would tell the veterans how wonderful they are and do absolutely nothing for them so that 22 of them were committing suicide every day. I would do nothing to fix the critical infrastructure of the nation particularly the electric grid, putting us at an enormous risk. I would get us out of the space program, knowing how many innovations came out of the space program, including your cell phone and many other modern conveniences, and also recognizing that in the future, he who controls space will control the Earth. Those are the things that I would do. Now, any resemblance to what's going on now, I'm sure it's coincidental, you know, but... But doesn't that, doesn't that give you a good indication of what we have to do, we the people, in order to, to solve our problems? Because what I have discovered since I've gotten into this political arena, which by the way is a very slimy place, and there are all kind of special interest groups and all kind of nefarious things going on. And it's one of the reasons that I absolutely refuse to accept money from special interest groups and billionaires who want to influence me. <laughs> Will not do it. I, I tell them, I tell them to go jump in the lake. And, uh, but the reason that I can continue to go on until the people realize that they should be voting for me and not for other people is because, is because we the people have decided to support my campaign. So I don't have to worry about you know, begging people for money. And I would never do that as president either because the only special interest group we should be interested in are the American people. And uh, we have to understand that We also have to understand that the political class, the pundits, and the media think that they have complete control of us. And in the past, they have. And I think it's getting close to the time when we need to shake them off and start thinking for ourselves. Because, you know, they keep leading us. They keep leading us to the same place. And conservatives in particular we need to understand that when they come and they say, you guys are people of such principle, and we admire you because you won't vote for somebody if you disagree with them on just this one thing. You'll sit at home like a person of integrity, and we admire you, and then they go and laugh at you because we have got to get everybody to understand that when you don't vote, you are voting, but you're voting for them. And we can't afford to do that because if, if we get another progressive president and they get two, three, or four Supreme Court picks, we're all gonna have to find another country to live in. So rather than allow that to happen and rather than to put our children in that position, we need to start thinking about what we're going to do. We also need to understand that unless we do the critical things, we're going to lose America. We have to change our tax code. We have to make it the kind of thing that encourages people rather than discourages people. And please, when you go home, look it up. BenCarson.com and read about our tax program. Forbes said it, it is the best, the most pro-growth. Several others have commended it also. We also have to get rid of all the unnecessary regulations. The regulations are killing us. And when you look at something like the clean power, the clean power plan, the EPA has said if we enact every aspect of the clean power plan, it will lower the Earth's temperature by 0.05 degrees Fahrenheit in 85 years. 
at a cost of billions of dollars and millions of jobs. It makes no sense because it's a regulation that is based on ideology. We need to get rid of all the ideological regulations. Regulatory reform, tax reform, get that economic engine rolling again, and then reducing the size of this ridiculous government. 4.1 million federal employees. It makes no sense. Tens of thousands of them retire each year. Don't replace them. That's what you have to do. And then 645 federal agencies and sub-agencies. 645. They all have fat. I would call in the director of each one of them, and I would say, I want you to cut your budget by 2 to 3 percent or resign, whichever one is easier for you. And then I would say to them, when you cut it, you have to cut it in a way that the American people don't feel it. Because the last time this happened with the current administration, they were told to cut in a way that people felt it the most, so that nobody would be asking for cuts again. There is so much excess there. And you know, having spent decades in the corporate world, sitting around boardroom tables, I learned a great deal about business and how efficiency works. And I can tell you that our government is very inefficient. A business run like our government wouldn't last for one week. And uh, we have a, 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 an obligation to give the people something that they can trust in. And this is what is lacking right now. There's no integrity. And, and I've encountered so much dishonesty and people who are just ambitious and people who will do anything and they don't care about the American people. And what I'm going to say to end is this. Thomas Jefferson said that we would reach this point in our country, that where we would not be paying attention and keeping an eye on the government and as a result, the government would do what all governments in the world naturally do. They grow, they metastasize, they infiltrate, and they dominate the people. But he said, just before we turned into something else, the people of America would awaken, would recognize they were being manipulated, would stand up, and would retake control of America. I say now is the time to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Carson. God bless you. Fantastic. How many of you are sick and tired of political correctness? How many of you are sick and tired of the bombardment in our culture of anti-police, anti-law enforcement, hatred and vitriol? You will love our next speaker, who served proudly as a member of the New York Police Department, as a Secret Service agent, and now as a rising star in the Republican Party, and my colleague at Conservative Review, Dan Bongino. Give him a warm welcome. Looking at my, uh, my name up there, it's kind of comical. I, I used to, you know, I worked with the Secret Service for a long time, and these men and women here tonight, they do a really, really tough job, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you know, their whole mission, right, is about, you know, we go first. If something bad happens, we're the ones that are going to get hurt, and you're going to go home, and you're going to be safe, and you're going to see your family tonight, but we may not. And it was a really great time in my life. And it was interesting walking in tonight. I saw an old friend. And you know, nobody gets VIP treatment with the Secret Service or anything. So I walk in, and I got my hands up for the you know, magnetometer. And they're like, you better check that guy twice. He knows exactly where to put this down. So it was all good. We were all clean. <laughs> Worked out great. But I only have a few minutes with you, so I want to talk about something very important. Because ladies and gentlemen, we are at, I know you've heard this a thousand times. But I mean this now. We are at a pivotal point in our country. We are at an inflection point where if you're not willing to stand up now, 
you're not willing to stand up ever. This is a different kind of political opponent we are fighting right now. Now, as Sean Hannity said before and many other speakers, I don't know who you're supporting on stage. I know where I'm leaning, but uh, I, I don't know who you're supporting. I see a lot of signs out there. But I can tell you this, regardless of who you're supporting, when this primary is over, it is game time, and every one of you are to go out there and take it back. Knock on the front doors. These elections are won on front doors, and you have to go out there and grab it and take it. It is your country we're losing, every one of you in this room. Now, why is this such a perilous time? Anybody can say that. You know, folks, we used to have disagreements about tax rates. Maybe you said it was 27 percent. I said it was 19 percent. We used to have disagreements about how we were going to run an education system. We're not having those disagreements anymore. You know what the disagreement we're having now is about? What the very fiber and essence of what that flag means, folks. There are men and women in this room, and you know who you are, who've done it yourself and you've had sons and daughters who have left their pound of flesh, sometimes their lives on a battlefield, to defend that idea. And it's that idea that's in jeopardy right now. It's not the tax rates. You know, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts in addition to the one I do. Shameless plug of the highest order, but thank you to all who listen. I appreciate it. Um, and one of my favorites, it was a, there was a guest on and he was talking about narratives. And it was a fascinating conversation. He was saying how, you know, do you ever notice how insects can, they can all act together like bees, they make hives, ants make hills. Marion's like, I've heard this speech before, right? These two narratives, right? Like narratives guide us. Narratives guide us, right? As human beings, we're not like ants, right? Like ants make little anthills. When you throw water on the anthill, they don't know what to do. But human beings build majestic structures. We built the United States of America, the greatest country in the history of mankind. But we did it, we did it because of a very specific narrative, a story, a true story, that we all here tell each other, that binds us together through thick and thin. But we tell each other that story here. And because of that, that flag, the left doesn't anymore abide by that story, folks. You know what their narrative is? You know what binds them together? Government force. Government force is going to dictate where the economy goes. Government force is going to tell you where your kid goes to school. Government force is going to tell you what doctor to see and when. Government force is going to tell you how long you can live. Government force is going to tell you what car you can sell on what day and what color. That's not what we believe in. We are, dict our, you know what, we are dictated here. Our, the narrative that dictates our lives, that guides us every day, is God, family, voluntary association, folks. We do this because we believe a higher power exists. We do this because we believe in a higher power, that a higher power said this is the right thing to do. We send our kids to good schools, and we want other kids to go to good schools because you know what? It's the right thing. It's the best thing for our country, and it's what Jesus Christ and what God would want. We are dictated by a different narrative. I'll leave you with this final thought. There's one common theme to all the world's great religions. No matter what your Judaism, Buddhism, Christianity, whatever, you may, whatever religion you may be. And that theme is sacrifice. Ladies and gentlemen, please do not leave anything on the playing field with this election. You know, when I used to box, they used to say, one more round. If you were losing, you go, one more round. I'm begging you, I'm imploring you as a friend, and I mean that. Leave nothing on the battlefield in this election. The country's future depends on it. Thank you so much for coming out. It's an honor. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Dan Bongino. Thank you, Dan Bongino. This is a perfect time to give a special presentation that we want to, uh, where is it? It's a surprise. Come on up. 
So we don't just walk the walk, we talk the talk. And I want to bring up from your community, Chief of Police Miller and Lieutenant Johnson. All right, you don't get to see this. We also have Master Patrolman Derek Loftus and his dog Saber. Officer Eric Kepke and his dog Valor. And Officer Jeff Burdett and Rocky. All of us here at Conservative View Review, and I want you to all help us too in thanking the Greenville Police Department for everything they do every day to protect and serve. Give it up. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. On behalf of Conservative Review, we would like to present you a check for $5,000 that we're donating to the K-9 unit. And once again, thank you and God bless you. Thank you. You bet. These are dogs we love to hear bark. The first candidate to officially get in the race for president. No exploratory committee, no mulling the pros and cons. Senator Ted Cruz of Texas will announce tomorrow he is all in. Today, I am announcing that I'm running for president of the United States. <laughs> most conservative candidate running, the most consistently conservative candidate running. I think Ted yeah. Cruz is a rock star. Cruz is like the conscience of a conservative in a Senate that is gutless, timid, and cowardly. If you're looking for the Republican candidate who is the most opposed to liberalism, it's Ted Cruz. We have some breaking news for you now. Texas Senator Ted Cruz has won Iowa's Republican presidential caucuses. Good evening. I'm United States Congressman Jeff Duncan. And if you know anything about me, you'll know that I'm an unabashed, consistent, Christian conservative, and I'm glad to be here in South Carolina, our home state. What a great night for South Carolina, and what a great night for the conservative movement. You heard Louis Gohmert say earlier about all the political battles that we fought in Washington, and many times it was a small core group of conservatives. Sometimes we were in the majority, but most often we were in the minority. As we fought against Obamacare, as we fought against funding Planned Parenthood, 
as we fought against executive amnesty and the Gang of Eight Comprehensive Immigration Reform Bill. Louis read a, a, a list of names of a small group of House members, but in those political battles, when we were in those foxholes fighting those battles, we weren't alone because there was another consistent conservative champion for the conservative movement in the foxhole with us, standing shoulder to shoulder with us. I'm proud to endorse and I'm glad to introduce tonight a true conservative champion, the senator from Texas and my friend, the next president of the United States, Ted Cruz. God bless the great state of South Carolina. Now, as I understand it, I'm the last thing between you and Mark Levin. That's a dangerous place to be. So I tried to think, what would Mark tell me? And I think what Mark would say is, Ted, keep it short. <laughs> Defend the Constitution, repeal Obamacare, and kill the terrorists. <laughs> and I got to say, that pretty much sums it up. Let me say to the men and women of South Carolina, thank you for sending to Washington a strong, principled, freedom-loving, constitution-defending, conservative knife fighter like Congressman Jeff Duncan. <laughs> South Carolina and Texas, we got a lot in common. There were South Carolinians who came to the Alamo, who bled and died so that Texas could be free. You look at our states, we're southern states, whole lot of veterans. Gun owners. I've been told in South Carolina, y'all kind of like your guns. Let me say, as a Texan, I understand. We love God. And we are fed up with the damage and destruction coming from the corrupt politicians in Washington. Thirty-four hours. We're thirty-four hours away from voting opening here in South Carolina. Thirty-four hours, and I'll tell you, one of the things I've grown to love about the men and women of this state is how seriously you take the job of assessing the candidates. You understand the country is looking to South Carolina. Iowa starts and it starts narrowing the field. New Hampshire continues, it narrows the field more. But then South Carolina, historically, its role has been to step up and ensure that the Republican nominee and the next president of the United States is a real and proven conservative. So on Saturday, we had the latest debate. It's a quiet little affair. 
whole lot of love on that stage. But I'll tell you, and I, I think in that debate, there were two questions that really rose to the top. The first was framed by the passing Saturday morning of Justice Antonin Scalia. Justice Scalia was an American hero. Justice Scalia was a lion of the law. He loved the Constitution. He loved freedom. You know, I had the blessing of knowing Justice Scalia for 20 years. He adored his wife, Maureen, who's Irish. I got to tell you, being Cuban, Irish, and Italian, that is a volatile combination. <laughs> and they love their nine children, their 36 grandkids. I got to tell you, Justice Scalia in three decades on the court changed the arc of American legal history, single-handedly shifted the Constitution and the interpretation of it back to the original understanding, back to the text and words adopted by the framers. As Ronald Reagan was to the presidency, so too Justice Scalia was to the U.S. Supreme Court. And his passing leaves an enormous void on the court. I think Saturday night at that debate, the men and women of South Carolina were looking on the people on that stage saying, who can I trust? <laughs> you know, I have to say, our very Bill of Rights hangs in the balance. We have right now an activist out of control Supreme Court, but we are one justice away from a five justice radical left wing majority, the likes of which this country's never seen. You know, before I was in the Senate, I was the Solicitor General of Texas, the chief lawyer for the state in front of the U.S. Supreme Court held that executive post five and a half years defending the Constitution and the Bill of Rights each and every day. We brought together a coalition of states across this country before the U.S. Supreme Court defending the federal ban on partial birth abortion, and we won 5-4. Five, four. That means there were four justices ready to strike it down. We are one liberal justice away from the Supreme Court striking down every meaningful restriction put on abortion over the last 40 years. We are one justice away from the Supreme Court mandating unlimited abortion on demand up until the moment of delivery with taxpayer funding and no parental notification. You know, the most significant decision, majority opinion of Justice Scalia's tenure was the case of Heller versus District of Columbia. I know Heller quite well because I represented 31 states in Heller before the U.S. Supreme Court defending the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. And we won 5-4. Five, four. We are one justice away. And what was the position of the dissenters? You know, the dissenters didn't say that some gun control laws are occasionally permissible. Instead, what the dissenters said is the Second Amendment does not protect any individual right whatsoever. They said it was merely a, quote, collective right of the militia, which is essentially fancy lawyer talk for a non-existent right. One more liberal justice in the Supreme Court will effectively write the Second Amendment out of the Constitution. It would mean that the government 
could ban firearms and not a single person here would have any individual right to challenge that illegal ruling in court. And there's religious liberty. In Texas, we defended the Ten Commandments monument that stands on the state capitol grounds. We went to the U.S. Supreme Court and we won 5-4. 5-4. We are one liberal justice away from the court mandating that Ten Commandments monuments be torn down in courthouses and city halls and public parks all over this country. And I'll tell you, the biggest case of my tenure as Solicitor General was a case called Medellin versus Texas. Medellin involved a horrible crime where two teenage girls were assaulted and murdered by a gang. They did unspeakable things to these little girls. One of those gang members, Jose Ernesto Medellin, was an illegal immigrant who came across the border, assaulted and murdered those two little girls. The case took a very strange turn because the world court, the judicial arm of the United Nations, issued an order to this country to reopen the convictions of 51 murderers across this country. Well said. It was the first time in history a foreign court had tried to bind the U.S. justice system. Texas stood up and we fought the world court and the United Nations. I argued this case twice in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. On the other side was the world court, was the United Nations, was 90 foreign nations and was the President of the United States. And I'm sorry to tell you, that President was not Barack Obama. It was George W. Bush. Now listen, I think George W. Bush is a good man. Unlike some people in this race, I don't think he should have been impeached. But he received some very, very bad advice in this matter, and President Bush signed a two-paragraph order that attempted to order the state courts to obey the world court. Well, I sat down with my boss, the Attorney General of Texas, Greg Abbott, now the governor. And I got to say, it was a strange position for Texas to be arguing against the President of the United States before the U.S. Supreme Court, particularly when the President was a Texan, was a Republican, was the former governor of our state, and was a friend. And yet I'm proud to tell you that twice I went before the U.S. Supreme Court and said, the United Nations and the World Court have no authority whatsoever over the U.S. justice system. And no President of the United States, Republican or Democrat, has the constitutional authority to give away U.S. sovereignty. And we won 6-3. On the final iteration of that case, that too ended up 5-4. We are one liberal justice away from the Supreme Court handing over authority to the United Nations and the World Court and international law and undermining the sovereignty of we, the people of the United States. What Justice Scalia's passing has done is underscored for the people of South Carolina and the people of this country the stakes of this selection. It is not one, but two branches of government that hang in the balance. 
And you know, if you look at Supreme Court nominations, the Democrats, they always get it right. The Democrats, every one of their nominees is a consistent left-wing knee-jerk vote. They get exactly what they want. Republicans, we bat less than 500. Many of the worst judicial activists have been Republican appointees. Earl Warren, Bill Brennan, John Paul Stevens, David Souter, Harry Blackman, the author of Roe versus Wade. Every one of those was a Republican appointee. And let me tell you why. It's not that Republicans secretly want to put liberals on the court. It's that we've had too many Republican presidents that frankly don't value the court, don't value the Constitution enough to spend political capital to confirm a real conservative. Where they get it wrong is they say, I've got some other legislative priority I care about, so I'll just go with a stealth candidate. Someone who's never said or done anything, has no paper trail. Let me tell you something. If you've lived 50 years of your life and you've never said or written or done anything to demonstrate you're a conservative, you ain't. And if by some miracle you are, maybe the Supreme Court of the United States is not the best place to find out. So here are the stakes of this election. If, God forbid, we elect Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders or some other socialist, we will lose the court for a generation. But if, God forbid, we elect some Republican who makes the same mistakes of the Republicans of the past, appoints a stealth candidate who becomes a liberal, we will see our fundamental rights undermined for a generation. And I believe the question the men and women of South Carolina are asking is, who do I know beyond a shadow of a doubt And I give you my word that every Supreme Court justice that I nominate and confirm will be a principled constitutionalist who will fight to protect the Bill of Rights for our kids and for their kids. We can't get burned again. We've been burned too many times. And the second major question that the people of South Carolina and the people of America are asking is who is best prepared to be commander in chief? Who has the knowledge, the experience, the judgment, the temperament? You know, Temperament was something on display Saturday night. Who has the clarity of vision and the strength of resolve to keep this nation safe? You know, this week here in South Carolina, I rolled out a major new plan to fundamentally rebuild the U.S. military. For seven years under Barack Obama, we've weakened and degraded our ability to defend ourselves. Under Barack Obama, his plan is to reduce the Army to 450,000 soldiers. That's too few to keep us safe, and we are going to grow it back to 525,000 soldiers. Under Obama, our Air Force has dropped to roughly 4,000 planes. We are going to grow it back to 6,000 planes to project force and keep us safe. Under Obama, our Navy has shrunk to 272 ships. That's the lowest it has been since 1917. A hundred years back, we are going to grow the Navy back to 350 ships to keep this country safe.
We are going to invest and build missile defense to stop against rogue nuclear states and protect the homeland. We're going to invest in cyber to fight against cyber terrorism and cyber warfare from China or North Korea or Russia. And let me tell you what we're not going to do. We're not going to allow political correctness to dictate what happens in the military. We are not going to be admitting refugees to America that could be infiltrated by ISIS. We are not going to be granting U.S. citizenship to people in this country illegally. And let me say this as the father of two little girls. We are not going to be drafting our daughters into military combat in the front lines. Two debates ago, when three Republican presidential candidates got up and said they supported that, I remember standing there saying, are you guys nuts? I halfway expected Rod Serling to walk out there saying, you have entered the twilight zone. <laughs> and I got to tell you, when it comes to ISIS, we will no longer have a president afraid to say the words radical Islamic terrorism. We will utterly and completely destroy ISIS. And one of the most shameful things of the last seven years has been the president sending our soldiers and sailors and airmen and marines into combat with rules of engagement that have their arms tied behind their back. It is immoral, it is wrong, and it will end in January 2017. If and when military force is required, we will go in with overwhelming force, kill the enemy, and then get the heck out. And let me say finally this. There are 5,000 people gathered here today. South Carolina has been subject to millions of dollars of TV attack ads, of radio attack ads, of mailers. The time for the media nonsense is over. This is our time. The men and women gathered here, this election will be decided friend to friend, neighbor to neighbor, pastor to pastor, South Carolinian to South Carolinian. If every person here in this stadium today brings nine other people to vote on Saturday, this stadium represents 50,000 votes in the state of South Carolina. Look around. The men and women gathered here have in your power the ability to alter the outcome of this primary to determine to make sure we nominate and elect a conservative. And I'll tell you this, we will have a president, number one, who we know will protect the Bill of Rights for the next generations. And number two, to every soldier, sailor, and airman, and marine, to every spouse, and child, and mother, and father of a fighting man and woman, you will have, I give you my word, a commander-in-chief who has your back. Thank you and God bless you.
Thank you, Senator Ted Cruz. Cruz. That man knows exactly what he's doing and exactly what he stands for. Thank you, Senator Ted Cruz. Hey, did you know that the hashtag CR convention is trending? Yes! Somehow we got through all of those social justice warrior filters at Twitter. Keep tweeting it. Keep telling the world and the media and the GOP establishment out there that we're loud, we're proud, we're strong, and you're still having fun, right? What'd you think of Senator Cruz's imitation of Mark Levin? Pretty good, huh? But there's nothing like the real deal. And many of you may have heard the very exciting news that Mark Levin is making the jump from radio to TV. It's about time! Watch this, folks. Levin TV, we will discuss President Obama's last state of confusion address. High thoughts on radical Islam and the immigration dilemma facing our nation. The endless debate on gun control. A salute to our great veterans. And a sit down interview with Senator Rick Santorum. All this and much more coming up next on Levin TV. This is where freedom rings. If you believe in America, if you believe in the Constitution, the Constitution empowers us. It's a new day. America's back. America's back and America's going to get strong again. We're going to defend America and we're going to defend our interests. Liberty's Voice, Levin TV. There's nowhere on television is there a show that's 100% pro-American. Today, the states are treated like afterthoughts. Why do we have a Bill of Rights? Government-run, iron-fisted, Stalinist-like health care doesn't work. One state that wants peace, Israel, and another state that is a terrorist state in the greatest republic on the face of the earth, we can't get an answer from the President of the United States. This State of the Union speech should have taken three and a half seconds. The State of the Union sucks. I am not fair and I am not balanced when it comes to defending this country and what's being done to this country. Stop right there. You see his right hand? Looks a little low to me. Just one man's opinion. There's a fellow by the name of Bernie Sanders. He's really a one-man freak show. And he keeps saying we ought to be like Scandinavia. Who the hell wants to elect a guy that wants us to be like Scandinavia? Let them be like us. Bernie. Yes, we'll be covering news, but it's not a news program. Yes, I'll be giving my opinion, but it's not purely an opinion program. We're going to look at history. We're going to look at economics. We are going to address politicians and current events. And we're going to talk to you through social media as well. Well, what can be done about ISIS? I think the bigger the bombs and the more that we drop, the better. You know, World War II, we fought that war to win. We were fighting fascism. We had the Third Reich. We had Tojo's Japan, Mussolini's Italy. And what did we do? All out war. When we commit this country to war, then damn it, war it is, kick their asses, Defeat them and get the hell out. The liberal media will not drive this program and liberal issues will not drive this program. We will drive this program. What we are here is pro-American, unabashed patriots. We feel positive about our country. We feel positive about our principles. And each and every night I'm going to come to you. I hope you'll join us in what is our new national town hall meeting here on television so we can discuss these issues, figure out how to get our country back, and move it forward. You want a name, I'll give you a name. For the next Speaker of the House, how about Mark Levin? Can you imagine the great one? 
Just picture the first conference with the Senate. <laughs> Mitch, we're not going to do it. We're going to follow the Constitution, I'm telling you, and we're not going to give in. He does a pretty good Mark Levin. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Levin. He was supposed to be here. Probably went to McDonald's. Well, I want to thank you all for coming here. Conservative Review, inaugural conservative convention. Well, you haven't heard me yet. We're here today to make it crystal clear not only in South Carolina, but across the country, that we are proud, true, unapologetic conservatives. We are not going to take a back seat to anyone, any group, or any political party. From this place forward, we will demonstrate the will, the strength, and the wisdom of our movement. And we declare here and now that it will be our solemn mission to wrench this great republic from the iron grip of the statists in both parties and their surrogates, and their surrogates in the federal courts and in the federal bureaucracy. We are not anarchists. We are constitutionalists. We do not seek to fundamentally transform our country. We seek to take our country back from those who fundamentally screwed it up. Now, the left rules by the mob and by imperial fiat alike. They are relentless. When they win elections, they claim a mandate from the people. When they lose elections, they rule through unelected branches of government. And too often this tyranny is acquiesced to and views as the inevitable decline of the American Republic. We're supposed to go as the Greek and Roman republics went. I say nuts. We conservatives, we Americans, we the people, we are the progeny of the American Revolution. An eight and a half year bloody war for independence and liberty against the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. And we remember the heroes who fought at Lexington and Concord and Bunker Hill and Yorktown and all the other battles. We are the children and the grandchildren of the heroes who defeated Hitler and Tojo and Mussolini. We are the fathers, mothers, brothers, and sisters of the heroes who are fighting the Islamic genocidal murders from one hellhole to the next. We are the American people, and we're different from other people. And in all these wars, 
and all these battles, all the blood, all the suffering, what were these patriots fighting for? Food stamps? The Department of Education? From the revolution to today, they were and are fighting for liberty. For the Constitution, for the Republic. Now, in context, this makes our political and cultural battles here at home seem a lot easier. Although they're nonviolent, in fact, they're more complicated. The statists use the instrumentalities of a free people against them. In other words, the institutions that grew out of the civil society are turned against the civil society. So our principles, beliefs, and values are crucially important. They're the antidote to the soft but growing tyranny. And if anyone is confused about what we conservatives mean by our principles, beliefs, and values, they can consult the Bible, the Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution. Now, we're in the middle of a difficult battle. It's even a daunting battle. And some have already surrendered with pronouncement that conservatism has failed or that conservatism needs to be modernized and updated with populism and nationalism, bullcrap. Let me remind you that despite all of it, conservatism has scored significant victories. Where is the Soviet Union today? It's dead. Reagan pushed the communists out of Central America. He pushed the communists out of Angola. He pushed the communists out of Moscow. He pushed the communists out of East Germany. Conservatism works. And Reagan created nationally syndicated conservative talk radio by deregulating broadcasting. Conservatism gave us the late, great Antonin Scalia. The problem is not the failure of conservatism. The problem is those who proclaim conservatism to get elected and then reject it once elected. In the last 100 years, there have been essentially two conservative presidents, Calvin Coolidge and Ronald Reagan. Hey, look, I'm not a politician. I'm reading my speech. That's the way it is. I don't give a lot of speeches. But on the other hand, unlike Obama, I write my own speeches. And I want the president to know I have a pen, too. And even more, we have what's called the Constitution. You can have your pen. We'll keep our Constitution. I even have an Obama phone somewhere here, I think. That's pretty good. So we've had basically two conservative presidents in a century who've held office for 15 years combined. What do you say we elect a third one? Yeah. 
We need to give the American people a choice between liberty and tyranny, between capitalism and socialism, between constitutionalism and lawlessness, between national security and appeasement, and between faith and secularism. Now is not the time for compromise. Now is the time for victory. I'm fond of quoting Thomas Paine. Reagan was fond of to quoting Thomas Paine. George Washington was fond of quoting Thomas Paine. As a matter of fact, the night before the Battle of Trenton, on December 23, Thomas Paine wrote in part these words. These are the times that try men's souls. The summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But he that stands by it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Washington read that and more to the troops before the Battle of Trenton. Their backs were literally against it. The British were on the move. He had just fled New York. The British figured they had him pinned down what was left of the American colonists against the Delaware River. The Washington outwitted him. And you know the story of the Battle of Trenton. Way too many American patriots and conservatives are prepared to surrender their liberty, are prepared to accept the muddledness of candidates who are running in this primary, and the, and the recent conversion to sudden principles that they never held before in their lives. This is not a time to take chances. We're not befuddled and confounded about this, are we? We've said time and time and time again we need a conservative, haven't we? We have a conservative, don't we? It's time for all conservatives to come home now and do the right thing. And if you're a conservative, you know what the right thing is. And you know what I mean. This election in South Carolina is very, very important. The election in every state is very, very important. We have to fight in each and every one of them. We will lose some, we will win some. But in the end, we need to win. We cannot leave it. We cannot leave it to commentators on TV. We cannot leave this election to people in Washington, D.C. who pull the strings of other candidates. We cannot leave it to others to determine our fate. This is the time, in the middle of a primary, this is the time to stand up and be heard. This is the time to make sure your family and your friends and your neighbors show up and do the right thing. Each and every one of you is a Paul or Paulette Revere. Each and every one of you need to take this message throughout your community, throughout your neighborhood. Each and every one of you are responsible not only for your own votes, but the votes of your family and your friends and your community. Nobody can stop us if we don't stop ourselves. God bless you, and God bless America, and thank you for coming. Carolina. Thank you, Gray One. 
God bless you, Mark Levin. So I've been told that Senator Marco Rubio tried to make it but was not able to. But what I want to focus on is what an incredible time we've had here tonight. Thank you, my fellow Americans. Thank you, my fellow conservatives. Thank you, Conservative Review, for putting this event together. And I want you to go out there and be the salt and light. Do not put your lights under a lamp. Do not stifle them. Hold them up high. You have a lot of important decisions to make in the coming weeks and months. Choose wisely and choose right. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you. to turn down the volume or turn up the volume. We make joyful noises because we believe in the opportunity that America represents. And right now, our movement is faced with a challenge. Will we be defined by personalities or will we be defined by principles? I'm talking about Bernie Sanders peddling socialism to our children. It's a dangerous thing. It's got to stop. Of course, even Bernie won't admit that he's a real socialist. He has to qualify it. He says, I'm a democratic socialist because he understands that amongst American voters, the S word is still a dirty word. In 11 years, all federal revenues will go only to the mandatory spending programs and entitlements. There will not be one dollar left for the national defense, transportation, education, or running the government. We must fight to take America back until we have no more breath remaining in us. How old are you, darling? You're 18. I care about your future. I see this young... How old are you, honey? Or, and by the way, I'm not Bill Clinton, I'm not a creep, okay? Uh, I could see Bill Clinton up here. Hey, Pumpkin, I'll give you a tour backstage in a minute. You know. It is time to expect victory. When Mark Levin says, would you come speak? Are you kidding? You betcha, I'll be there. So I'm thrilled to be here with such good friends. If we were so bad, why are so many people trying to get in here and nobody trying to escape? Leave nothing on the battlefield in this election. The country's future depends on it. Thank you so much for coming out. The next president of the United States, Ted Cruz. I think what Mark would say, Ted, keep it short. Defend the Constitution, repeal Obamacare, and kill the terrorists. We seek to take our country back from those who fundamentally screwed it up.